Lord, as we continue in the spirit of worship, I just pray that you would speak in this place, Lord, for I have no wisdom of my own that is worthy of listening to, Father. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, yeah, a little translation issue with the, the PowerPoint. Continuing in a, a series that I started last week, um, did you bring your Bible with you? Remember that was the, the request, let me see your Bibles. We've got some saints out there and a few sinners I see. I'm, I'm encouraging you to bring your Bibles. I know that uh, we're in a digital society, and, and for some, your, your app or your tablet or whatever has become your primary Bible. I understand that, and if that is a successful way of using it, uh, I think that's fine. For me, the digital is still a supplement. Uh, the physical Bible continues to be uh, the, the, the more comfort level I have for my uh, Bible study and time, So, but if that works for you, that's fine, but we're, we're really focusing on some practical and pragmatic uh, realities of understanding our Bibles and the importance it is to know uh, uh, how to handle this wonderful tool that God has given us. So that is the focus. This week, uh, the seed of faith. And I'm going to jump right into the, the children's, the kids' quiz. So I got Toby. I, I think these mics will, will work. The black. Let me grab it off the piano. Sorry, i got to take a little journey here. I have always enjoyed having an interactive moment in my messages with young people. Uh, so I learned this from another preacher when I was young who always started out his sermons with uh, what was called a kid's quiz. So I didn't invent it, but I sure have enjoyed using it. In the Bible, Jesus tells a lot of parables. And one of the parables he tells is about a farmer who goes out and sows seed into the field. So I just want to see what you can remember about that story. If you're a young person here, just raise your hand. Uh, we like to use the mics so that it can be heard in the recording and that everyone can participate. Uh, so let's get right into it. If you remember the story, what kind of soils did the seed fall? Jesus gives some descriptions of the soil. Um, what, what kind of soil? So I see Isaiah. Just give one, too. Don't say them all, Isaiah. The footpath. The path or the road. Very good. And then... Is that Ezra? Or is that Eric? Ezra? Is the black one got power? Try, try it again, Ezra. We have, we, well, this AV training next week, guys. Let's get it. <laughs> Let's make it. <laughs> Wheat. Wheat. Oh, okay. That might have been some of what the uh, seed was. So thank you, but we're, we're, we're also wanting to know the kind of ground it was going on to. Mr. Shabalovich. Stony soil. Stony. So we've got the, the pathway or the road. We've got stony. Uh, there's a couple Mike others, Chuck. though. Anyone else? Okay, we've got some young people over here. This is how we get our steps in here for, for Toby and Jaden. Kids stay pretty spread out, so we get to find them this way too. Dylan. The thorns. Okay, the thorny ground. Okay, we've got the path, we've got the stones, we've got the thorns. Uh, there's one more ground, Abel. Oh, I'm sorry, Nico. Oh, Nico's uh, letting Abel give it a try. Wheat. What? Wheat. Wheat. Weeds. Well, that's kind of the thorny, you know, the thing. So I like where you're going with it, but we need to find that last one that hasn't been mentioned. And Nico, can you say the last one for us? Or Titus? The good soil. Okay, the good soil. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, it could have been salty, swampy, sandy, but God, the Lord uses these. These were ones that farmers were common, uh, knew were common. Uh, so let's talk about those just for a minute. What happened to the seed on the path? What happened to that seed? Did it did it do well? Did it did it start growing? Do you remember what happened? Raise your hand, Mr. Shabalovich. 
<laughs> okay, Isaiah. They got stepped on and got ate by the birds. Oh, it got stepped on and it got ate by the birds. We might say it gets stolen. The pathway, you know, the farmers, they would walk on these lines and it became the path. They would cast their seed, um, but where they walked, obviously, the ground would get compact. And so anyone, uh, as a matter of fact, Desire of Ages says that when Jesus was giving this parable, people could physically look out and see farmers actually doing this. So Jesus was almost saying, you see what's happening out there? Let me tell you a little bit about it from a a spiritual standpoint. So they understood this. If the seed falls on the path, it's probably not going to last very long. It's going to get stolen. What did... What soil did the seed sprout but was later choked out? Which, which of the soils choked the seed? Mackenzie? I see Mackenzie's hand. Help us out. The thorny ones. Okay, the thorny ones. All right, the ones that had the weeds in it. Obviously, they were unable to be successful so because there was a competition in that soil, and therefore it couldn't succeed. What happened on the rocky soil? Come on. Come on, kids. Mom, dad, you can help out. Isaiah is on top of it. I love it. All right. And then Aaron over here might be able to help out. I think that's Aaron's hand. It wilted because it had not deep roots. It wilted? Was that you, Aaron, also wanting to help out? They had no roots. They had no roots. And so it grew, but then it withered. It wilted. It didn't have the stability it needed sprouted, but then withered away. Last one. Now the parable is this. The seed is the what? I see several intelligent young people. Oh, one over here, right? No, come on, come on, guys. Come on. A.B. The Word of God. Oh, A.B. beat you to it. Sorry, guys. Appreciate you trying to help out over there on the wings. Jade and Toby, adequate performance today, gentlemen. (laughs) Thank you for your help. Yeah, Jesus says, and it's particularly uh, clear in Luke, and that's why I chose Luke. Jesus says, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. He uses a tiny little gram of life, and he says, that's what the word of God is. So I want to examine this with you for a few moments today as part of this series on the Word of God. First, turn in your Bibles to Luke 8. I'm trying not to put the verses on the screen as much. I want you to use the Bibles that you have. I want you to see it in your own versions. I want you to get familiar with turning the pages or finding it on your digital, whatever you use. Luke chapter 8, that's in your New Testament, Dean Jake, just so if you're looking for it, New Testament, gotcha. Luke 8, and beginning in verse 11, it's it's the summary part, Jesus has already given the parable, now he's giving the explanation. Now the parable is this, the seed, he said, is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who've heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. They will not believe and be saved. Verses, verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, but in time of temptation, they fall away. Notice that Jesus uses a slightly different uh, explanation of the problem of each of these soils. The path do not receive the, the seed at all, so they're not saved. The rocky soil receives the word but falls away. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and they go on their way. They are choked with the worries and riches, and Luke is the only one who adds this next part, the pleasures of this life. Matthew and Mark both use this parable as well, but only Luke adds that other element to the thorny soil. The ones that are, uh, they hear, they go on their way, but they're choked with the worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and therefore they bring no fruit to maturity. So on the road, they do not receive the word, so are not saved. On the uh, stony ground, they fall away because of temptation. The problem with the thorny soil is they bear no fruit. 
No fruit is born. They grow, but they get choked with the competition in that soil. And so the point of the seed never matures. Verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. An honest and good heart. Here's the word. Holds fast and bears fruit with perseverance. Did I cause it to crash? Now, a little bit of, of, again, this is all kind of about the practicality of your Bibles and your Bible study. The very last word in my Bible in verse 15, it says that they will bear fruit with perseverance. With perseverance. Now, if you're familiar at all, uh, you know, kind of with the the Adventist uh, 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 way of looking at, at at Scripture and the Great Controversy, does the word perseverance jump out to you at all? Maybe you thought it in the term of patience. Patience. All right. Okay. This would become from Revelation fourteen twelve. Here is the perseverance or patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments and their faith in Jesus. The same word is used here in Luke. The perseverance that the word provides for us is not just for our own personal edification, but is lasting and enduring and necessary in the last days. Here is the perseverance. Here is the patience of the saints. It's called a word study. I'll give you a couple other illustrations of that. Um, as we move along. So just notice here, the whole message, while the seed of faith, okay, the Word of God is described as a seed. In another place, Jesus talks about how faith is like a mustard seed. So I put the two together. The seed of faith is the main focus, but we're going to move beyond that as well. First of all, notice, the seed goes everywhere. The farmer casts the seed upon the entire field. Every heart that is able to be touched by the Word of God, is given that opportunity. The seed is not restricted to only a certain type of heart, a certain type of soil. The seed is intended to be broadcast broadly. Okay, okay, a little redundant there. It is intended to be spread wide. Okay, Jesus does not limit the ability of His message, His gospel. And sometimes we are caught off guard by which soils turn out to be good after all. Jesus wants the entire world, every heart and every soul, to have opportunity to decide what kind of soil it wants to be. Okay? The seed goes everywhere. Secondly, I just think it's a remarkable thing. Uh, We talked about the Bible. You know, last week it was the sword of the Spirit. Okay? And, and we, we think of the Bible as a powerful thing, as a mighty thing, as a life-changing, life-transforming thing. And yet Jesus says, well, it's all those things as well. It's also tiny. It starts out tiny. And when you think about seeds, it really is a miracle. It's just a, a wonder of how God has design, designed things. You know how tiny seeds are? Any of you garden ever? I used to do a little uh, uh, flower boxes outside our, our porch at our, our house when we lived in Spokane. Plant little marigolds and peonies and stuff. And you'd buy that little packet and you'd be like, there's nothing in here. What is in there? And you'd, you'd hear like a little rattle of something. And then it, you'd pour it out and there'd be like 10,000 of these microscopic little, you're not even sure what they are. But you, you mix them in with the dirt and they grow. All the genetic material is there, tiny in that tiny little seed. I, I've been to the Sequoia Sanctuary um, just outside of Sacramento once in my life, my first time. Any of you ever been to the Sequoia Forests? There's both the coastal and the inland Sequoias. Um, the, uh, got to see the inland Sequoias just outside of Sacramento and Calaveras County. And uh, uh, th- there's a reason they call those things a sanctuary, by the way. When you walk through those trees, you feel like you're on sacred ground. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it at the time, and I've lost it over all the years of moving, but I picked up a sequoia pine cone. You're not supposed to do that. Did you know that? I didn't know. But they're everywhere, and I thought, this is kind of cool. I have lost it, moved many times. It got put in a box or something somewhere. The pine cone of a sequoia is about that big, right? And, And that tree goes 300 feet, the largest living organism on earth. The cone is that big, which means the seed within the cone is even smaller, You know, other trees like the snow pine, I mean, its pine cone is like that big. 
It's, it's huge. But for the sequoia, all, everything necessary for the largest organism on earth, a tiny little seed. I thought to make it a little bit more local to Arizona, we got the saguaro cactus, right? Pretty big, pretty impressive as far as cactus go, right? That's the seed of a saguaro cactus. These mighty 60, 70, 80 foot uh, uh, massive uh, uh, cactus that grow, they start from that. There's a lesson to be learned there. You just need to accept a tiny, open your heart a little bit to the word of God. Allow it to germinate and you will see God grow a mighty organism of life and power and wisdom in your life. And he can do it with just a seed. He can do it with just a little bit of faith. The word of God is tiny but mighty. Seed is living and enduring. Now, I'm not a, a biology or a science teacher. Is a seed alive or dead? Well, it's not dead. If it was dead, every time a seed grow, you'd have a little miniature resurrection, right? It's, it's kind of like inert life. It contains the potentiality of life. Did you know that archaeologists have discovered in ancient burial tombs in Egypt and China, where they have discovered seed that had been put in canopic jars or whatever, you know, with the buried prince or, or emperor or whatever. They found seeds thousands of years old, and they've planted some of those seeds, and they still grew. Seeds are enduring. That little kernel of life, uh, it doesn't evaporate quickly. It is living, it is enduring, and there's other passages in the Bible that says the Word of God is also living and enduring. Seed is powerful. Seed bears fruit. Now this is important as part of the, the message for today. The farmer did not go out into the field just because he wanted to turn a dirt field into a field of grass. Right? The farmer wasn't out doing that just so that he could be you know, growing a golf course and wanted to see a nice lawn out there. The farmer went out there because he was sowing seed that he wanted to later harvest. He wanted to harvest. He expected and desired the seed to reproduce. Okay? The Word of God is not given to us. And remember, it, the seed grew in the rocky soil. The seed grew in the thorny soil. But since it produced no fruit. Since it did not have a harvest, it was of no value. The Word of God is given to us, not just so that we can appreciate it ourselves and say, wonderful, Lord. Mm, I really like it. I'm going to add it to the number of things I appreciate in my life. The seed is specifically given to us so that it will reproduce itself in us so that we become the Word of God. Not, not to say that we become God. You're looking at me kind of strange, some of you. <laughs> but so that we too have the power to share God's Word in other people's lives and see it be productive as well. Very, very important. Just because we have a living relationship with Jesus Christ, that's a good beginning point, but it should germinate into an actual productivity or else what's the point of having the seed to begin with? It all depends upon the heart. All of these soils are illustrations of the heart. What kind of heart? Is our heart filled with things that compete? Is it thorny? Is our heart filled with, with rocks that keep us shallow? Are we not even allowing the faith to even touch us? We're a hard pathway, and the devil can just come and flick that seed away or peck it off the ground like a bird? Or are we allowing the seed of God's Word to really implant itself in the honesty and goodness of what the Holy Spirit's tried to produce in all of us to begin with? Again, this is the series that we're doing. I have put some materials in your bulletin. I put the notes from last week. Remember last week, the sword of the Spirit, right? We were, we were taking care of business, right? And so uh, you never know what you're going to see when you come to church. But Pastor Dave went into battle and uh, was able to uh, win the victory. <laughs> uh, I did, I, again, just for, for you, this was kind of the summary of, of what I was trying 
to convey last week. I went ahead and put it in some notes for you to review about what the illustration of the sword of the Spirit is. And then I also gave you a little homework. Did you do your homework? Did any of you actually do it? Did you bring it with you, any of you? Didn't bring it? Okay, you don't get credit if you don't. Oh, okay, we do have a few who brought it. <laughs> Again, this was all about trying to familiarize yourself with your own Bible. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you even know your own Bible? Now, I'm not going to get a lot into uh, the debate of uh, English versions. To be quite honest, I don't get the debate. Um, uh, and there are pros and cons to every, every English translation, and, and there's other translations as well. But well, what I did want to share about this is this. You simply need to know as much as you can about your translation. Um, I'll share with you just some some things about my own, and I brought some other examples as well. I, I shared with you that my primary translation, probably because I find it to be fairly neutral in its biases, is the New American Standard Bible. Now, every Bible has a bias, okay? Every Bible does. They have a, 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 a thinking that goes into them. Now, again, this is not designed to make you question your Bibles. This is designed to make you a better student of your Bibles when you understand more about it. Um, my Bible, the New American Standard, uh, which I use uh, primarily among others, uh, comes from a very conservative Bible society, the Lockman Foundation. And it is a word-for-word -word design translation. But no, let me say something first about this difference between word-for-word -word and thought-for-thought. -thought. One of the benefits of having such a multicultural church is so many of you that are bilingual, you understand that language is dynamic. Things do not perfectly translate from one language to the other. And why I say that is I'll meet some Christians who say, well, I want the literal Bible. I want it to be as literal as possible, as word for word as possible. Um, and I, I like to play with them a little bit and say, well, that's wonderful. I, I certainly want that as well. But how would you translate words like honeymoon and hot dog and cowboy into another language, especially one that may be thousands of years removed from those things and has no idea what a think about those words literally a hot dog literally a honeymoon translate that literally and see if someone has any idea what you're talking about there has to be some dynamism to the language or else it's illegible things from culture i have one here that i bet a lot of you will struggle with translate hippie or yuppie or beatnik. I bet there's a lot of you who are going, I have no idea what he just said. We're kind, of a, we're kind of getting removed from those realities, aren't we? From the 40s and 50s and 60s. Translate those. Put those in German. Put them in Japanese. Put them in... Where's Pertiva? How do you say that in Bangla? Hippie. Say it word for word. No, literally... I don't know either. Other cultural terms from sports, slam dunk, home run, touchdown. We use these words in, 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 in phrases in, in more than just a sports context, right? How the job interview go? Hey, it was a slam dunk. Hey, did you, you know, did you get the new deal? Oh man, touchdown, right? We use these, you can call it slang, figures of speech. Now take those words, put them a thousand years from now in a culture that's never seen a football in their life and translate it literally. You understand what I'm getting at? Language is dynamic. And we need to understand those who say, oh, I want the literal Bible. I want the literal Bible. There's no such thing as literal in that way. There is a a focus on word for word, and there's a focus on thought for thought, and there's going to be subtle differences, sometimes significant differences, but try not to be too focused on that whole idea of literal. It just is not real when it comes. Our language is filled with metaphor. Our language is filled with figures of speech and idioms. We use it every day without even realizing it. And so the Bible is the language of God through humanity. There is dynamics to it that are necessary when it comes to our translation and our interpretation. Um, 
Oh, I wanted to give you a couple examples from my new American Center. I didn't take pictures of this. I apologize. You're just going to have to trust me. Um, the Lockman Foundation, it's a, it's a conservative Bible translating group. They use several denominations, but there's always biases. Let me give you a couple of examples of biases in your Bibles. Most, virtually every translation, except for some of the very, very recent modern translations, continues to translate the word glossa in Greek as tongue. Tongue. Okay, Jesus, the Bible says that the gospel is going to go out to every nation, tribe, and tongue. Okay? The word glossa is literally tongue, but it means language. It means language. But most of your Bibles continue to translate it as tongue. You want to know why? Because of the charismatic Christian movement that prefers the word tongue because they believe in speaking in tongues. So to be respectful or to be accommodating to one element of Christianity, almost all of your modern translations, no matter the context, no matter the application, will almost always translate glossa as tongue. Even if the Bible lit is, is specifically saying it's a language, right? From Revelation 14, he's not saying that uh, the gospel is going to go out to everyone with a nah, 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 nah. He's saying to every language. We clearly know that, yet every English translation, most of the modern translations, continue to translate glossa as tongue because they are trying to be accommodating to the charismatic wing of the church. Okay? So that's a bias. That's a bias. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean you should tear it out of your Bible and say, how dare you? It just means you need to be aware of these things. All right. Uh, Revelation. This is just in my Bible, if you have uh, my version of it. Uh, this is a couple of areas that I want to show you that you just need to be aware of things that can happen in your Bible translation, okay? Uh, most of your Bibles will give you headings. The editors will add, like, you know, what's happening in the chapter. It's not part of the original text. It's just telling you what's going on, all right? In Revelation chapter 6, it's the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Okay, and the heading in my Bible says, the book open." the first seal, and then it says, the false Christ. The false Christ. The editors have now moved beyond just simply telling you what's happening. They're now interpreting. They are telling you as the editors that you're now reading the, that the, the, the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. Now, by the way, if you haven't studied this before, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we don't believe the white horse is the Antichrist. We believe it is the true Christ who came in the first century and died on the cross. Now, if you're not careful, sometimes we're just reading our Bibles and we read those headings and we're reading it as though it's Scripture. You just need to be aware. One more example in Revelation. Revelation 12. In my Bible, there's a heading. It says, the woman. Right? Remember the woman? She's standing on the moon. Uh, the stars are on her head and she's clothed with the sun. Beautiful. But it says the woman, comma, and I've actually scratched it out. Because <laughs> it says the woman, comma, Israel. It's now the Lockman Foundation is starting to interpret the Bible for me, and they're not doing it in a way that I value or believe. So I've scratched it out. Now, I've never scratched out the actual verses before, <laughs> but those headings, you got to be careful. Your Bible, no matter what Bible you're using, has strengths and it has weaknesses. And as a Bible student, as a person trying to care for your sword or appreciate that tiny but mighty seed that God is trying to plant in your heart, you just need to be aware of what's going on in your Bible. You just need to be aware. Learn as much as you can about it. Learn about their philosophies, their biases. Now, let me be clear. Next week, I'm going to talk about inspiration and revelation. I believe that God's authentic, true purpose and understanding can and is found in every modern English translation of the Bible. I am not a believer that there are cursed Bibles and there are blessed Bibles. Some get pretty close, I'll tell you that. And paraphrases are different, annotated uh, Bibles are different, etc., etc. Okay? But I believe any modern English appropriate editor, edit, editorialized uh, Bible, God is still working through, and His true and authentic Word can be found in that. And I would say that true for um, um, the Spanish uh, translations as well. Um, maybe German too. <laughs> A 
the Luther Bible. If you're German, man, uh, as passionate as, as English speakers are, maybe about the King James and, and uh, Spanish about the, the Reina Valera, man, the Germans are passionate about the Luther Bible. But I think it can be a distraction. So anyways, I wanted to talk about uh, our versions when it comes to that. Uh, the key verse, and I'm going to use this throughout the series and we're going to spend time, comes from 2 Timothy. We reviewed it last week. I want to point it out again this week. Be diligent, Tim, uh, Paul says to Timothy, to present yourself approved to God as a workman. And I want to talk about that word. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So throughout the Bible, we are instructed, both Old and New Testament, that we are charged to be carefully holding and understanding and appreciating this. But when you read this passage, it can bring up several questions. And I said last week again, Paul is not telling Timothy he needs to be approved to God because he's a sinner and he needs to come to salvation. He's saying you're already ministering, you're already a disciple, but now you need to continue in your work and not being ashamed by accurately handling the word of truth. So I did a little research on that word, workman. The very first time that word appears in the New Testament, if you do a word study, is in Matthew chapter 9. And it says, then he said to his disciples, by the way, in my Bible, the pronouns related to God are always capitalized. Your Bible may use that, may not use it. There's pros and cons to that. But my Bible does. When it's trying to tell you whether it's Jesus talking or God talking or some other narrator talking, it'll capitalize the pronoun. So I just illustrate that. He said, so Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, when you compare these passages side by side, you see they're almost exactly the same sentiment. Paul is telling one of his disciples He's telling one of his followers that you need to be a faithful workman in handling the Bible and be not ashamed of how you handle the Bible. And here Jesus is telling his disciples that they also need to be faithful workers. But in this verse, it's very clear what the work they're supposed to do is. The work they're supposed to do, is it for their own benefit? Are we to be accurately handling the word of God so that when we get to the kingdom, God's going to say, all right. Let's have a test. Everyone, write your name on your paper. Write one through ten. Let's see if you get it right. Is that how we're supposed to be handling the Word of God just for our own benefit? Are we workers of the Word of, the word of God simply so that we can sit in our own study and say, man, I really understand prophecy now. I really understand the Ten Commandments now. Jesus says the purpose of you being a worker is for the benefit of others. Do you, do you see that? That's not, that's not too complicated. Now, any of you who've been in this church for a while, you know that I have a couple hobby horses that I get on from time to time. Christians spend way too much time worrying about their own salvation rather than focusing on the salvation of others. Not a sin. I mean, what if I say it again, Forrest? Maybe people, sometimes when you say it a second time, then people really get it. Christians spend way too much time worried about their own salvation that they forget that God has given them the seed of truth and the seed of faith to produce salvation in others. We are workmen not to work out our own salvation for our own benefit, but because God wants to reproduce in us the ability for others to see the glory and grace of Jesus Christ. If you get nothing else today, guys, if you forget everything else I say, please get that. God wants you to know this book because there is a world out there that needs it. They're not going to get this from Hollywood. They're not going to get this from Washington, D.C. They're not going to get this from anywhere else unless God has open hearts that are honest and willing to take the seed of the Word of God and let it be reproduced in you. 
The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So the work that Paul is telling Timothy of accurately handling the Word of God, look how the New Living Translation puts it. A good worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains. That changes our understanding of the verse. The New Living Translation is more of a thought-for-thought translation. It doesn't mean that the other translations are wrong, but the New Living is, is saying, what is he trying to say? And so they add this word, explain. We're not to just be accurately handling the Word of God for our own benefit, but so that we can explain to others what it is that God has done in our lives. So, if we're going to have greater confidence in God's Word, be better students, higher committed, and have a deeper love for Jesus Christ. Again, if our only focus on this is for ourselves, it's going to be limiting and it's going to be insufficient. Ask the Lord to make you a good student of God's Word so that you can share it with others. And it'll make all the difference. When it comes to our Bibles, you'll hear the word canon used. Canon comes from a German word. It means the rule. So the canon means our rule of faith. We believe in the Christian church that God's authoritative word can be found in the 66 books of the Bible authoritative. There's a lot of people who believe the Bible is inspiring and that the Bible is inspirational. But there are many who struggle with the idea that the Bible itself is inspired. But within the Christian faith, within the Seventh-day Adventist faith, we accept and endorse that our Bibles contains the accurate, authoritative Word of God. Now, we don't like authority these days. Many people struggle with that. They'll say, I'll take it as far as it can go, but when it gets to areas I'm uncomfortable with, then I'm going to wrestle with it and I'm going to set it aside. But, you know, we have also rational reasons for believing the Bible beyond just a carte blanche. Oh, it's just an act of faith. The Bible comes from us from ancient origins. You can go back almost as far in human history as there's writing and culture, and that's where Scripture begins. It's of ancient origins. It's one of the reasons why we believe God has inspired it. It has a cohesive message. This Bible was written over 1,500 years. Moses, the first author, if you take the the early writing in 15th century B.C. up until the first century A.D. when John writes the book of Revelation. 1,500 years. And yet over 1,500 years in three major languages across three continents, there is a singular cohesive message that can be found in the Bible. That's miraculous. That's not by accident. It has prophetic fulfillment with specifics. Isaiah specifically mentions the name of the Persian king who would overthrow Babylon. Jeremiah predicted perfectly the fall of of Jerusalem to Babylon. And specifically in the life of Jesus Christ, more than 40 specific fulfillments are found in the life of Jesus predicted in the Old Testament. So it has prophetic fulfillment. The scope of the Bible is almost as wide as can be. Many religions focus on ethics, but have nothing to say of the afterlife. Some talk about beginnings, but have nothing to say about relationships. The Bible covers almost every aspect from beginning of time and creation to the afterlife and the end of time to ethics, civil responsibility, relationships, love, marriage, everything. The breadth and scope of the Bible covers almost every aspect of human life. And then lastly, you have the testimony of the community. Through the last several thousand years, those who have accepted the words of the Bible talk about how it's changed their lives and it's improved society. We have reasons to respect that the seed of God's Word is real, enduring, and active. As we close, I'm going to ask you to turn turn in your Bibles to one more verse. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. The T's are all together in the New Testament. The Thessalonians, the Timothys, and the Titus. And it goes from the longer ones, Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 and 2 Timothy 2, 
And then the smaller one, Titus, comes third. So if you can find the T's, you'll find 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 15 to 17. And the apostle writes to the young man, Timothy, he says this, Timothy, from childhood, you have known the sacred writings. Now, by the way, what writings is he talking about? Is he talking about the New Testament? He's talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament's in process of being written. So from childhood, you have known the Old Testament, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Don't be too quick to throw away your Old Testament, friends. Paul says that the wisdom that leads to salvation in Christ Jesus is in the Old Testament. And then he says this, all Scripture is inspired, and now my Bible gives a little footnote, and if you go to the column, it tells you what the word inspired literally says. All Scripture is God-breathed. That's the little literal Greek. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Every good work that God wants to do in you begins with you accepting the seed. And allowing that seed to grow. Not just so that you can say, I've got this wonderful thing growing in me, but so that you can be equipped to be used of God to help others also experience the grace of the grace of Jesus Christ and experience salvation. I think it's worth praying about. How about you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father. I know that there's so much more we could ask, do, say on this topic. But Lord, um, please, we live in a day when Satan is, trying to, Satan is trying to steal that seed away. He's trying to fill our lives with thorns that will compete and push out and stunt the growth of that seed. Our hearts are hard and filled with rocks so that the seed may be there, but it has no strength. It can't be of any benefit. Father, help every heart be honest and pure and rich so that your seed may grow in us. Help us to cherish our Bibles. Help us to love your word. Your word that is living, is enduring. The only word that really makes a difference. We know that there is a world that we are a part of. We are not to isolate ourselves and ignore. You give us a field to work in. And you ask us to be a co-worker with you. That can't happen unless that seed is growing in all of us. Bless us, Father, I pray. May we rededicate our lives to knowing your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.